Great. Hi, everyone. This is Marav Fine. I'm calling from the Jewish Funders Network in New York, um, and I am joined today by a group of folks in Louisiana who are going to tell us about the Jewish response um, to the flooding that's been going on recently in Louisiana. Just as a reminder, the Jewish Funders Network is um, a group of high net worth Jewish philanthropists committed to increasing the impact of their philanthropic dollars by working together. Um, each of our programs is based in one of our JFN values, which you can find on our website. This one sort of, this program sort of encompasses everything, but I think most importantly, um, it's it's our uh, responsibility to repair the world, tikkun olam, and working together through philanthropy and through community um, to make a better, a better Louisiana for the, the Jewish folks and for, for everyone who's living there and has been dealing with this. I want to first introduce um, Lynn Weil, who's the owner of Lynn Weil Consulting. And she's here on the line, and she's going to introduce the rest of our wonderful speakers and she um, has her own consulting uh, business. She has been, my goodness, has such an impressive resume. I don't want give it, to give it all to you, but she's been working really actively in the community, serves on the board of trustees of the Congregation of Nei Israel and many other Jewish and community organizations in leadership roles, and she's the chair of the Baton Rouge Flood Relief Task Force, which is how she comes to us today. So without any further ado, uh, Lynn, uh, please introduce the rest of your team. Thank you so much, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lynn Weil. I was born and raised in Baton Rouge and have been actively involved in the Jewish community all of my life. And on behalf of the Federation and all of our families affected by the recent unprecedented flood that hit our state and our community, thank you for this opportunity to speak with you today. During the next hour, we will attempt to paint a picture for you of the magnitude and scope of this historic, extraordinary flooding event the destruction and devastation it brought to this area, the local flood relief efforts made thus far to assist our families affected by the flood, and the very serious issues and needs that now face this community since the flood. With me today for the webinar are Anna Herman, director of Henry S. Jacobs Camp in Utica, Mississippi, who worked with the Jewish community immediately after the flood and for two and a half weeks thereafter on loan from URJ, Anna continues to participate actively in our flood recovery efforts. David Spivak, Associate Professor of Chemistry at Louisiana State University, an active member of Congregation B'nai Israel and a survivor of the recent flood. And Joanna Sternberg, Flood Relief Manager previously the Director of Development and Communications for Jewish Family Service of Greater New Orleans. Joanna has 20 years of experience in nonprofit administration and joined our team exactly two weeks ago today. The Great Flood of 2016, as it is now being called, began with extraordinary amounts of rainfall starting on Friday, August 12th and lasting through Sunday, August the 14th. How eerie is it that the flood occurred on Tisha B'Av? Although Tisha B'Av is primarily meant to commemorate the destruction of the temple, in modern times, Jews understand it as a day to remember many tragedies that have befallen the Jewish people throughout history. The Baton Rouge flood of 2016 is yet another Jewish tragedy to occur on Tisha B'Av, and it is yet another chance to show our Baton Rouge resilience. While there is no substitute for seeing firsthand the aftermath of the disaster, we will try to show in pictures and words the unbelievable damage and devastation that occurred on on Friday, August 12th, and Saturday, August 13th. The Greater Baton Rouge area received 32 straight hours of measurable torrential rainfall, 
that broke a Louisiana record. According to Louisiana state climatologist Barry Kime, we crushed it. It wasn't even close. Rainfall rates of up to two to three inches an hour were reported in the most inundated areas. The previous record of 24 inches was beaten with over 31 inches of rain in three different sites around the greater Baton Rouge area. It would have taken 14 inches in total to be considered a 100-year event and 21.3 inches to be considered a 1,000-year event but we received 31.4 inches. Three days before the heaviest rain started, the storm that caused the flooding began to look like a tropical depression, but national weather experts didn't track it for some reason. Hence, no one in our area had any warning or expectation of what was to come in order to prepare like we in Louisiana always do with approaching hurricanes. This storm and its aftermath of devastation caught everyone by surprise and horror. Rich, poor, black, white, healthy, sick, this flood did not discriminate. 150,000 homes suffered damage. 80% of all damaged homes had no flood insurance because these homes were not in a floodplain where flood insurance is required, nor had they ever flooded before. Among those, East Baton Rouge Parish and the city of Baton Rouge, where our two synagogues are located, had 35% of our homes and businesses damaged in the flooding. The bedroom parishes of Ascension and Livingston, where many members of the Jewish community live, had about 90% of their homes significantly damaged or declared a total loss. Almost 281,000 people were displaced. At least 30,000 people were evacuated from submerged vehicles and flooded homes by local law enforcement, firefighters, Louisiana National Guard, the Coast Guard, and fellow residents. Many boat-owning residents of Louisiana and Mississippi, together with other volunteers, formed an informal rescue service known as the Cajun Navy and navigated through flooded areas to answer calls for help that they received via social media, like Facebook Messenger. Were it not for this Cajun Navy, the bravery of first responders, Many more than 13 people who lost their lives might have died in the flood. These heroes rescued and brought to safety so many in this community and so many of our Jewish families, and we are indebted to them. I am haunted by the words of a friend rescued from her attic by one such hero as the flood waters rose to over five feet in her home. She told me, I didn't want to drown in my attic. 21% of businesses were destroyed. Damage estimates are now at $8.7 billion without counting the costly infrastructure needs that are expected but are still being calculated. The projected cost to the United States economy is between 10 and $15 billion, making it the fourth cost costliest flood disaster in U.S. history. So far, over 139,000 people affected by the flood have registered with FEMA for disaster assistance. Approximately 11% of the affiliated Jewish community received damage. Most had very significant damage, and virtually all of these families have been displaced. At this time, we think of the words of the Talmud, Kol Yisrael, Aravim ze beze, all Jews are responsible for one another. Dating back to 1858, the Baton Rouge Jewish community has mirrored the development of Baton Rouge. Together with our status and home of our state university, Baton Rouge has flourished in recent decades as has our small but very vibrant and active Jewish community. In
contrast to many other Jewish communities in Louisiana, Bat Rouge's Jewish population has grown significantly post-World War II and has remained steady in recent years. Compared to other Jewish communities around the country, our Jewish infrastructure is very small. We have two strong synagogues, Beth Shalom Synagogue with 130 families and Congregation B'nai Israel with 215 families. We estimate the unaffiliated to be 50 or more. As one member of our task force likes to tell her New York City friends, there are more people in your apartment building in New York City than our entire Jewish community. Besides the two congregations, Baton Rouge has a Jewish federation which holds a part-time executive director along with a small Chabad presence as of a year ago. That's it. We do not have the resources that larger Jewish communities have. We have no Jewish community center, no Jewish family service, no Jewish children's regional service, no Jewish endowment, and so on. But small does not mean lack of vitality, ability, might, or determination. Baton Rouge Jews have always pulled together in times of crisis. After Hurricane Katrina, our small Baton Rouge Jewish Federation, which has only one part-time employee, took in hundreds of refugees from New Orleans, working with national Jewish relief organizations. We also coordinated a rescue operation that pulled stranded people out of the Lakeview section of New Orleans after the levees broke. Our federation took on the responsibility of caring for the economic and emotional well-being of Baton Rouge became the home of the Jewish Federation of Greater New Orleans, Jewish Family Service of New Orleans, and other Jewish organizations for months after Katrina. Baton Rouge played a crucial role in the Jewish response to Hurricane Katrina, as it has always done for other hurricanes that have affected the Louisiana Gulf Coast and our fellow Jewish neighbors to the east and west. This time, we are in a different place of not being the caregivers, but instead we now have to rely on our friends in New Orleans and around the country and world for help and assistance, and so many have heeded the call for help. We are blessed. Anna Herman is one such friend who saw our need and heeded the call. She will share with you the local efforts made to date to assist our families affected by the flood. Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, Lynn's voice completely went out. What happened? I had no idea I completely went out. Oh, okay. Keep talking. I, I finished my part. I passed it to Anna, but we can't hear anything. Yeah. Can you hear me? Anna. Hear yes. Okay, we can hear you now. You can keep, keep going. Okay, I, great. I just want to echo everything that Lynn said and also thank the Jewish Funders Network for letting us tell our story because while we could speak for days about the devastation and the destruction, there's so much good um, that is happening. After the flood, the congregations began reaching out to their congregants and not just to their congregants, but people, anybody they believed to be Jewish. They did not get hung up on who paid dues or who was at services. They just wanted to help. They had people on the phone all day, all night. They were trying to determine who was in need. They began assessing what was needed. Spreadsheets were created. People wanted to help. So we had our spreadsheets, and then it didn't stop there. Then people got out their hammers and their work gloves, and they went to the homes, and they began getting the homes. In Baton Rouge, there was a real race 
to begin demolition because you're in race against mold. So everyone stopped what they were doing and they went out and they helped. They were trying to find housing. You know, after this happened, when Lynn ran through those numbers, you heard the huge numbers and percentages of homes that were damaged. Now imagine trying to find housing. Also, along with all the housing problems, there were transportation problems. Everyone lost their cars. If people were on the phone to Pensacola, to Mobile, to Birmingham, all around the southeast to try and find cars. We were trying to collaborate and consolidate all of the information out there because all we wanted to do was to help our people. We wanted to get them safe. We wanted to get them dry. So the congregations were both working night and day to help their congregations and to help the Jewish people in need. It became clear that we really needed to have a collaboration and a consolidation, and so the Jewish Federation of New Orleans loaned a staff person to work with the Executive Committee of the Federation, and then I came to Baton Rouge to work with the Federation. The two temples decided to really join their efforts together with the Federation because all anybody ever wanted was to help the people in need. So everyone came together to work under a consolidated umbrella. I think it's pretty unique that politics don't get in the way and that he says, she says, don't get in the way. But this community, all they wanted to do was help. So in addition to um, the two congregations, there were federation staff. And then we ended up, because there you know, was so much need, if you can imagine, 11% of the Jewish community was affected, 11%. We had to hire a flood relief manager to really help our flooded federation director and to handle the coordination around the community's flood relief efforts. Um, I think that everything that has been done and still needs to be done really just shows the heart of Baton Rouge um, and the Baton Rouge community. And part of that heart, I was very privileged to meet David Spivak. David Spivak is a professor at Louisiana State University. He's an associate professor of organic polymer and bioanalytical materials chemistry. He is a father of two sons, and he is a, a flood survivor. And I just want to thank David for being with us today. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I have a lot to say. I've been through uh, quite a bit of, of this experience, and I might even like this by David, we can't really hear you. Oh, okay. um, can you hear me better now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thanks for letting me know. So I'd like to preference this by saying that uh, I was here for Katrina and Gustav and Isaac and all those other hurricanes that we had, and, and they were adventures. I lost some power, some pieces of survived it. Uh, we, we didn't um, need any help, really. It was, you know, a, a little bit that you could fix up. Um, and uh, and they were advertised very um, extensively around the world. Katrina is, is world famous. Uh, and then there was this disaster. And I live in a, in a floodplain, so I have flood insurance, but the records of the house, as far as it goes back, was that there was just a tiny little bit of water once in 1983, nothing very serious, and uh, the area is very nice. It's next to 2,000 acres of woods that we have permission to go back on, and it's right around the corner from uh, my twin boys' school, and uh, only 10, 15 minutes away from a major university. So ordinarily, we survived disasters just fine in the past. And then this flood was announced, or, or at least heavy rains to bring in flood was announced. Uh, and we took it seriously. Uh, we, we saw that this was coming. Um, and predictions were made that this was going to come in Sunday night. And Friday and Thursday night and Friday, we began sandbagging protecting uh, our place. Um, <clears throat> we had a neighbor who was getting a, a large moving van, but unfortunately had to go hours away to pick that up. He was leaving on um, Friday uh, to return on Saturday, 
and the predictions said that's great. Flood doesn't come till Sunday evening. Um, so much for product, uh, predictions. That flood came in early Saturday morning. Um, as soon as I got up about 8 o'clock, thinking I still had a day and a half to prepare, there was three feet of water in the street. I drive my cars in or out, uh, and the whole plan was to have that time to drive belongings out and bring more sandbags in with the entire Saturday that was supposed to be there. So when people say, hey, didn't you know that that flood was coming? I did, and, and I was preparing for that, but something was off. Uh, I don't think um, meteorologists have experienced it quite like this before. Their predictions were very off, and, it, uh, and so the ability to plan was very off. My neighbor, who was bringing a moving van back, never made it back on Saturday. And he was one of the most prepared people I thought. So <clears throat> we, um, w when we say that there was a slow rain and yet we were taken by surprise, that may sound um, paradoxical, but it was not. Um, this this surprised us the way it it uh, it, it happened, and so. that I thought was going to be clear with my two boys and two giant dogs in the house. And we um, we see water start to come in maybe uh, into the house. Fro the road, it was already three feet, starts coming into the house a couple hours later. And we're busy trying to move things a little bit higher, hoping that, you know, maybe three feet um, might, might be as bad as it gets. So we're going to get things higher than three feet. Hello? Hello? David? Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, it sounds like someone is trying to fax something on the phone line that you're on. It, it does. I don't it, have a fax line on this phone. It's, it's some sort I do of... do not have a fax line. That's very strange. So, okay, so keep going. So, um, so the water starts coming in, and it's coming in pretty fast. Maybe a, um, an inch every couple of minutes. And while I have my sons helping me um, for the first half hour, maybe longer, maybe an hour, moving things up, this was going fast, and it was time to get them and the dogs out. And while my boys could walk out of the water, the dogs couldn't comfortably walk out of the water. But the fire department was then boating regularly by and picking people up. So I had my sons and dogs uh, taken uh, up to <clears throat> above the flood, and, uh, and they were picked up uh, by their mother at that time. And I remained behind to see what I can do uh, to save things in the house. Uh, and so it was a process then that I kept moving things up sort of laterally all around the house, maybe a foot or two higher than the water level, and then I would start putting things in the attic until that water reached my level of the longing. I would move everything up another two feet higher on shelves and things like that and buy myself some time to move things into the attic. Uh, and I did that as much as I could, uh, which, which actually had... Uh, many hours all during the day, although progress is slow as you're trudging through the water. And when it was about chest high, uh, I left. And I think a lot of people would say leave. A person should leave sooner than that. Um, they, <clears throat> they may be right. I was uh, confident uh, with my uh, abilities at that time. So I walked out the door with uh, at, at about five that, that evening, and um, I had belongings in a, in a um, backpack, and I was holding it over my head. And I think you've seen aerial photos of people walking in a flood with the same thing, holding their belongings above their head. Well, that one was me. Um, and what I didn't know was the current, it runs very fast in the middle of the street. So hugging the sides of the... Um, of the I um, made it my... Uh, made it up to the end of the street, at which point uh, I was picked up uh, by a boat, uh, which was nice, and taken to, um, to the edge of my subdivision, but that was still four miles 
uh, before a, a no-enter zone. So the police correctly um, stopped traffic coming into the area well before the flood areas were. Uh, so that's good. People shouldn't be coming in, but it was a little difficult uh, getting myself to that line uh, so that I could be picked up by friends. Um, <clears throat> so they could only drive to that point. And I had a bit of a hike after a long, tiring day. Um, but we were all out by the end of the day. And then we got to watch this flood. Uh, and I, I got to see, as this picture here shows, it filling up my room. Um, but it kept on going. Uh, and I kept hoping it would stop. And it kept on going it hit the three feet mark, four feet mark, five feet mark, and it kept on going. And I just started wondering, when is this going to stop? Uh, so I stayed myself with colleagues and, and the dogs and, and my boys with their mother, but um, <clears throat> that was just the beginning. We had uh, dog food bags that exploded and created a perfect storm. Dog food dissolved created a thin film about the entire house as the water receded over the next two days and created a mold problem like no other adjuster had ever seen. Apparently dog food is a, a great medium for growing mold. So is 100 degree heat and almost and pretty much 100 percent humidity and I had furry walls and mold growing at an alarming rate. So <clears throat> it was then uh, that I was gathering uh, help. Uh, I had uh, some wonderful help from colleagues from the university and from volunteers from the synagogue, uh, and it took um, two days uh, to remove just the contents of the house, some of which you can see here, and then getting carpets and pieces that had mold growing like crazy and it smelled really bad. I don't really want to tell you how bad it smelled in there and uh, people couldn't spend a lot of time in there and then we had to gut the house and I was insured. It's one thing to be insured. It's another thing to actually get people to help you. Uh, when there's a lot of people who need help, it's limited out there. So again, uh, my colleagues, uh, at the university and friends and, and, and members of the uh, temple were the most help at coming in and tearing out drywall and pulling out the smelly stuff and piling it up uh, in the front of the house. Uh, and this took several days. Uh, it took two, three days to move things out and I was working morning till night with, with lots of help. Uh, exhausted at night, and, and at the same time, there's things to do. There's um, registering with disaster assistance, and this takes time, and filling out paperwork. And um, I was very happy that uh, my boys and dogs had a temporary place to stay, but unfortunately, I didn't get to see very much of them. And they're very worried during this time. We um, contacted each other a bit uh, with uh, texting and things like that, which only actually started working uh, after all the floodwaters died away. There was terrible AT&T coverage. And so we didn't get to talk much during the disaster. We didn't get to talk uh, a whole lot after fixing it just because uh, the exhaustion and time level of taking care of all of these things. Um, and then my desire uh, after being able to spend a week or after a week or so getting the house gutted and everything out front uh, was to find a place to stay. Another very difficult, difficult process uh, when everybody else is trying to do the same thing. Um, and so uh, calling agencies for renting apartments, condos, houses takes time. Getting them to show you these things takes time. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, the kids School was also flooded, so they're not in school during this time, and uh, kind of not in the loop as much as they'd like to be. During, I'd say about two weeks, I got to see them one night. I, we had a date for dinner. We had a wonderful dinner for a couple of hours. It was very nice to, to touch base, but uh, missed them. And finally had the luck of uh, being able to rent a house and 
even after I rented that house and took the sign down, many people were coming afterwards uh, to ask if it was still for rent. I, I understood their predicament because I had been asking for uh, probably 40 places before that, and I was the one turned down many times, and so I could understand uh, their efforts in the search. Um, and so the house, uh, <clears throat> it was like moving into a new house. So I have a, a gutted house that I have a house I'm moving into all at the same time. And for me, uh, I'm a professor at LSU, our classes actually started one week after this flood occurred. And they were going to give me the time off, but I'd rather uh, keep the continuity of teaching the class. So I said that I'd, uh, I'd like the chance to see if I can uh, uh, take care of it, which I was able to do. But the level of busy uh, had me exhausted morning to night. And it's still that way, although the, the emergency is gone. There isn't mold growing at an alarming rate, but... Uh, there are a lot of people who need a lot of rebuilding and recovery, uh, and and they need things. So um, things like uh, I needed to buy a washer and dryer. Uh, delivery into Baton Rouge isn't so quick, uh, and laundry mats are available. This is true. Um, we had to buy a refrigerator, um, and uh, same same problem. So shopping every day was a hassle, and. Um, <clears throat> the kids are temporarily displaced. We're all together at the same house now, so this is a blessing. It took a while. And it makes me feel very happy, and it brings me strength. So we have our dogs and our kids together and me, and things are, are getting routine because their school did finally um, start up. And so it's good to be able to go to school, to go to work, to come home, do the sports, but just this morning, I met with the first of many contractors. Two never showed up. The one this morning did, so I'm very thankful to them. They're hired. If they're good and they showed up, they're, they're hired. Uh, but there's plenty of um, debate with the insurance companies about what should be covered, what shouldn't be covered. And now there's an interesting situation where uh, the, the state and the federal government are not sure that these homes should be um, torn down or not. And so uh, it's very confusing when you're trying to recover. If, <clears throat> if, you, if recovery efforts should be done at all. And so it, I know government officials are working at uh, their fastest speed, but um, but they, they really need to continue. Uh, to keep a clear idea of what is expected and what's going to happen uh, in the recovery process for the rest of us to follow. Um, so I think that that's where things stand now. And uh, Joanna Sternberg, she's the one in charge of what comes next. So I think I'll hand over the phone to her. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. This is Joanna Sternberg, and I'm the Flood Relief Manager for the Jewish Federation of Greater Baton Rouge. Dr. Spivak is just one of the many people in our community whose family was impacted by the 2016 flood. There are so many other stories, though. I will try during these last minutes to give you a better idea of the challenges this community is presently facing and will continue to address in these next months. The goal of the task force and the liaisons is to help families through the steps from post-evacuation to a state of stability. The community here is tight-knit and determined to work together to achieve this, even above and beyond previous efforts of collaboration in the past. Four weeks have now elapsed since the flooding, and 42 families with both long- and short-term needs have been identified. At this point, we don't expect the numbers to grow too much more but we were still hearing about other families as late as last week, and those two families now also have access to our networks of support, which now makes it 42. As Lynn mentioned earlier, the greater Baton Rouge area has always had a small but vibrant Jewish community. Now, with 11% of its affiliates affected, the Jewish community in the greater Baton Rouge area is in an active state of recovery and restoration. Even though the flooding itself occurred a month ago, the work, the work of the task force will continue for many months to come, and perhaps well over a year.
stability for these families will shift and change. Resources are and will continue to be stretched. The rabbis and the congregations are being asked to shoulder many of the responsibilities that are usually handled by entire agencies. This crisis is also occurring at one of the busiest times of a normal year for them. Rosh Hashanah, as you know, is barely three weeks away. Part of what the task force is charged with is helping to address the present and future issues that are facing the residents of the greater Baton Rouge Jewish community in the aftermath of the flooding. These include things like home remediation. At present, most of our families' homes have been gutted, but now everyone is waiting for and looking for contractors. You can be on multiple lists for weeks before someone is able to come by to provide an estimate. And in the case of one of our families who actually secured a contractor early on, that contractor just quit and the family is back to square one. It also includes issues relating to housing and transportation. As long as home remediation continues and families are displaced, many will teeter on the edge of homelessness perhaps several times before their own houses are suitable for living. We received a note recently from one couple who had been offered a space by friends after the flood but were recently given 48 hours to vacate and are now desperately seeking a space for themselves and their dog. For now, we know they ha will have another place to stay for this week, and we are actively seeking appropriate housing for them. They have been draining their personal savings and are still hopeful of getting married in October, even if it means a small pizza party instead of the reception they envisioned. For people who also lost their cars, there is a lot of competition to replace them. When over 200,000 people in your community are looking for vehicles, rental or purchase, it's sometimes more practical to travel over 100 miles away to get one. This is what happened when another member of our community who has found a friend to take him all the way to Mississippi to purchase an affordable replacement. Social services are also important. As you can imagine, going through an experience like this has taken and will continue to take a toll on the mental health of our community. We know of two families who, in the immediate aftermath, could not cope and simply left town because of the stress. Most families have stayed, but must deal with navigating the labyrinth of federal, state, local, and insurance paperwork for assistance. Many are wondering if their jobs will remain intact. And most of all, they are trying to provide a healthy support system for their children and their families when they are barely holding it together themselves. The Jewish community here is committed to restoring affected families, providing the reinforcement necessary that will support the strength of local traditions and a return to normalcy in the future, even as that will likely be a new normal. Many families here have lost everything, and they are among the hundreds of thousands of their neighbors, colleagues, and friends who are also in the same position. You can go through entire neighborhoods here and see pile after pile after pile of personal effects and moldy sheetrock in giant mounds on the curbs. They represent lifelong collections of carefully cho chosen acquisitions, sentimental memories, and hard-earned accomplishments, and now they are all gone. The piles have been there for weeks, and the delay in removing and disposing of thousands of metric tons of waste is a continuous reminder of that loss. In looking ahead, it's incredibly important for our small Jewish community to be a respite and a resource for the affected families. To provide those necessary supports, there are a few adjustments we have had to make to our own infrastructure for that to happen. To help address social service issues, Jewish Family Service of Greater New Orleans helped the Federation recruit and screen a case manager. She is currently based at one of the synagogues in the morning but then must work at home in the afternoons. To truly offer professional case management services to the families, it will be important to find a more permanent space for her for at least six months to a year. Our accounting expenses will also be going up. So far, the task force has been able to offer small increments of financial assistance to the, the affected families, but the processing and distribution of these funds will require services above and beyond what the Federation's accounting firm usually provides. Finally, we realize that our children are in a vulnerable position, and it is important now more than ever to reinforce their Jewish identities and experiences. Unlike larger communities, 
the religious schools here, which serve approximately 70 students from kindergarten to confirmation, provide one of the strongest educational reinforcements for Jews in the Deep South. Because many of our families are struggling in a variety of ways, the decision was made to waive enrollment fees for them this year, which will end up as a loss of already minimal resources for the synagogues. However, we felt this was needed in order to keep the community as intact as possible and to serve as a respite for our families. The Alfred G. Rayner Learning Center is a Jewish preschool that serves 93 students and maintains a waiting list of approximately 150. Enrollment is religiously diverse and admission is extremely competitive, though priority is always given to Jewish applicants. Other programs like the local Temple Youth Group, which here is called BARFTI, it's a NIFTI affiliate, Jewish summer camp, such as the URJ's Jacobs Camp, and Israel Experiences all provide form, uh, formative environments to create committed and engaged Jewish adults. Year in and year out, these connections have been our children's lifelines to the Jewish world, and we are concerned that families will find it difficult, if not impossible, to prioritize the expenses this year. Some of our affected, flood affected families have camp aged children who have never experienced Jacob's camp before. We always try to encourage attendance, but know it is unlikely that flood affected families will choose camp for the first time this year. Hello? Hello? Your call went out. Can't hear you. We can't hear you. So unfortunately, we lost sound. Um, but as you can see, there are um, the contact information for everyone you heard speak today is here on uh, this final screen. You can contact Joanna. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, I'm just going to put this to my ear, and we'll go okay. from there. My apologies, everyone. We've had a little bit of technical difficulty here. Um, I'll, just to kind of quickly finish up, um, this recovery will likely take many more months and potentially a few years before the families are fully stabilized. The task force through the Jewish Federation of Greater Baton Rouge is committed to supporting these families as much as it is able. While the short-term goal is to restore the Jewish community to what it was, it's important to note that it will have an additional impact on the recovery of the city of Baton Rouge as well. The families who were affected were and are good neighbors, good friends, and good civic partners. They are more accustomed to being in a position of giving back and are eager to return to that role. By helping these families to re-engage, it will also enable the Jewish community to have a voice in the recovery of the entire Baton Rouge area. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today on behalf of all of us. We welcome any questions you may have or if we can be of any further assistance. As she said, the information is on this last slide. Thank you. Okay, thank you all to our wonderful speakers um, and your, your resilience and your bravery in this is truly inspiring. Thank you um, for sharing your stories with us. Um, and for letting our members know um, exactly what's going on and, and what y'all are doing to fix it. So um, if you have any questions, as, as she said, you can reach them. Um, Joanna Sternberg, you can reach Ellen Sager. You can also, if you'd like to reach out to me, um, Marav at jfunders.org. And um, we look forward to speaking to you all soon. Take care and good luck, everybody.